This is a call to action. This is Troy Mond. I'm the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Mission. Welcome to our mission, your mission. Welcome to the house of God. You have been called, appointed, you have finished the race. When I was lost, I didn't know what to do. I wouldn't be here without you guys. Forget those things which lie behind and reach forward to those things which are ahead. Now I know God saved me, he brought me here, and the mission has done a lot for me. They saved me. When a woman comes into our program day one, what she can expect is a warm, Greeting. My initial goal was to come, get myself together for a couple months, then leave. My mind was forever changed the moment I walked through the door. The LA Mission and Ann Douglas Center has been one of the biggest, biggest changes in my life. We understand how important it is to greet them with dignity and compassion. Let's open this place up. Yeah. I'm grateful to launch today on what we're calling our Dignity Dorm. It's our stabilization center. What we'll see today is just an example of what can take place when people uh, commit to making a difference. The ability to house 100 people means that we're going to save 100 people. So when they need services, they can get services. When they need support, they can get the support that they need. Time is appointed for us to worship. We're calling for the churches to come out and support us. As we walk the streets today, it's obvious that our communities have been ravaged by uh, poverty. We need all the help that we can get to end um, homelessness in Skid Row. Across our nation, long dry lines of people needing food. Poverty and hunger is not just a skid row issue. It's not just an issue that normally people would associate with people being homeless. We really want to address the systemic things that are tied to um, poverty in our country. And this is our effort, our heart compassion to reach out into our community like never before. This is ground zero. I'll be sharing with the stage to this afternoon about how we're taking back this community. We're gonna take every block in this city, one block at a time, we're taking it back. If we do it here in the epic center of what Skid Row is in terms of homelessness, I think it'll transfer to off the city, LA County, the state, maybe even the nation. Let's get it done. We are cooking things up in the kitchen. Yes, so today we have uh, prepared enough meals for 1,500 people. Get as much as you want, we wanna feed you. If you need to come back for a second helping, please do. Our meals are gonna happen. We have barbershop stations. People are gonna be able to get haircuts. They can get manicures today. We have clothing boutiques. We have toy giveaways, shoes. We are so delighted to be spreading our holiday cheer with our friends and neighbors of the community. what's happening at the Los Angeles Mission. I look forward to working with Pastor Troy because what goes on here is one of the solutions that we need to have in order to get people off the streets and into housing. When we give an opportunity to an idea of marshalizing resources together under one comprehensive approach, that's when we begin to make changes.
everyone. Can you hear me? My check? Yes. 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 Got to make sure this thing works first because we're going to be talking about some really important things. But I want to do a room check. Hello. Good, af good morning. Afternoon. Still morning for me in Los Angeles, but good afternoon, everyone. All right. All right. Well, as... Um, as it was said before, we um, are inviting everyone, even if you're in the audience or if you're watching digitally, to um, submit questions so that we can toggle through those as well because we're gonna be getting down uh, and talking about something very important and near and dear to all of us on the stage, right? Mm -hmm. The homeless crisis that is taking over all of America. As someone who grew up in Los Angeles and still lives there, um, I see it and um, am I honestly um, get emotional all the time, and which is why I decided to be a part of what the mission was doing. So um, I'm happy to be able to be here this today to help um, have this conversation and dialogue with you guys. You ready? Yes. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so let's start off, and this question is for all three of you guys. Um, why is homelessness in America so pervasive? I think it's because it's morphed um, into various aspects of diversity in terms of who makes up the population of homelessness now. And so everywhere we go, it's in our face and mainstream media shows it in a way that um, it's always in our face. And now when we go down our streets, when we turn our freeway um, corners, um, when we are just walking down the street to walk our dogs, we're seeing someone now that's homeless. And I think the reason for that is because we have moved from six degrees of separation to one degree of separation. Everybody in this room probably has some experience with somebody. And I think now is the opportunity for us to now marshal all of our resources together and begin to understand that these are our friends and our neighbors that are now falling into a state of homelessness. Um, and it's so in our face, um, so pervasive, um, because we see it all the time. And it took something like COVID to really begin to expose the weaknesses of our country in terms of all things that can happen in one moment. A lot of people that are facing challenges are one paycheck away from actually living on the street. And what we're finding in our community in Los Angeles and what we see across the nation is that um, the, the state of homelessness is not what people think it is. It's not just a person that is mentally ill. It's not just a person that's suffering from some sub, um, issue. Um, it's also our youth that are coming out of the foster care system. It's our women and children that um, are now fleeing domestic violence situations. It's people um, leaving one country, moving to a next country, trying to find a way of escape and coming to the land of promise. And we um, should not fail in that promise to be able to provide the basic needs that people have. And so now that we have it in front of us, and I think homelessness itself is um, an indictment on um, whether or not we are our brother's keepers or not. And I think that it's time for us to answer the call. Um, well, there are a number of reasons of why it is so pervasive. It's not any one thing. We have some people who have done well and they get paid off, laid off from work or they lose their job. And all of a sudden, they don't have huge savings and they work very hard to try to keep the family together, but it's just not possible if you don't have an income that you're getting that you were accustomed to. Those people just fell on hard times. Then you have other reasons. You know, in Los Angeles, for example, we went through a terrible time with crack cocaine, and families got involved that I never thought could have gotten involved. Yeah. And of course, all of a sudden, Everything that they had went toward getting high and getting the drugs. And so not only were they not working, uh, they were doing other things uh, in order to, you know, survive as an addict. Uh, but those people, many of them, are elderly in so-called Skid Row now. Mm -hmm. And I know it because when I go into Skid Row and hear my name being called, 
and I look around and people would say, well, I was in Nickerson Garden Housing Project. Don't you remember me? I was in Jordan Downs. These are people who were victims of drugs. Uh, we have other people who work every day on minimum wages. They can't keep up with the increasing cost of rent. They don't have not only down payments, you know, to try and buy a home, they don't have what it takes to get into a rental unit in order to pay the advanced amount that it takes in order to secure a unit. And so they try very hard. They work every day. But when they look at their earnings, they are trying to pay 50 to 60% more mm. for rent uh, than they can afford, and it just falls apart. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're talking about people who fall on hard times are people who are victims of drugs and alcohol. Uh, and I haven't even mentioned, even though it's talked about more uh, than it should be, not everybody's crazy, but there are a lot of people with mental ill problems that are just unattended to. And we don't have the resources to really deal with them, not only in our area, but in this country. And so for all of these reasons and more, uh, it is, growing faster than we can keep up with it. And we need more developers who are willing to build affordable housing. But I've got some ideas how we can keep the cost down so that it will be more attractive to build affordable housing. And a lot of it has to do with our cities, our mayors and our city council people. Mm -hmm. We should have one-stop shops where you can go and get licensing and permits and not have to wait a year. Huh. You cannot have the requirements for uh, those who are willing to build low-income housing to have to move wires and do other kinds of things. That's really the responsibility of the city. But when you load them off on that developer, uh, it, you cause, uh, it, it costs so much more. Uh -huh. And they cannot afford to do it. And it's not attractive for them to even be involved with it. Now, we know that we went through a problem with COVID where uh, we, they could not get the materials and the cost was very high. So all of these kinds of things have created a growth in homelessness. And we have got to deal with it, not as if there's one way to get it done, but multiple ways, both public and private, in order to deal with getting homelessness eradicated in this country but I believe it can be done. Yes. 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 I believe so too. Uh, I, I just want to thank all of you. This is, it is an honor to be sitting here. All of you. And for all of you, thank you for taking the time to join us. You could be just about anywhere in Austin right now, yeah. eating tacos or listening to music or watching films, and you chose to be here talking with us about homelessness, and I'm, I'm so glad that you are. I believe that not only is homelessness solvable, I, I believe, I, I totally agree with you, Congresswoman, on that. I think, we can, I think we can figure this out, and I'll, maybe we can get into that later. But I believe homelessness is a failure of systems, not a failure of individuals. And Pastor Vaughn, you said this, it's, are we our brother's keeper? Are we our sister's keeper? Do we care enough for each other that we're gonna create a society where housing is viewed as a basic human right just like breathing air or eating food or sending your kid to school. We're not in that society right now. We're gonna to have to talk about how we can get there. But I think it's a failure of systems and I think it's a failure of multiple systems. And what we've just heard is there are a lot of different faces of homelessness. And I think that's true. Every, every single person who becomes homeless has their own unique pathway into that, their unique set of circumstances and their own pathway out of that as well. And if those systems are failing people, and I'm talking about housing and healthcare and education and our, our, our carceral system, if those systems are failing people, well, those systems were designed by people. They were designed by policies. They were either funded or not funded by elected officials. And if we made those kinds of policy decisions that have gotten us to where we are now, we can make different policy decisions to solve homelessness, and I, and I really believe that's true. The, the last thing I'll say about root causes here is that when I was born, that was just over 50 years ago, just to put it out there, 
1970, we had a surplus of affordable housing in this country. That's right. Of about 300,000 units. We had more than enough affordable housing to go around. Today, we have a deficit of 7.3 million affordable housing units. Now, on any given night in the United States, there are something like 600,000 plus people who are homeless. Over the course of the year, that is significantly higher. The question is not why is there so much homelessness, it's why isn't there more, given the fact that we have a seven million unit deficit. And I think that is a testament to the work that you all are doing in Los Angeles. It's a testament to the work that so many amazing housing organizations and provider organizations are doing in this country. But that is a deep hole that we have dug ourselves into in 50 years. And the, the single most important driver of that is the federal government has, over those years, scaled back its, invest, in its investment in affordable housing. And we, as the federal government, need to continue to step up on that. And Congresswoman, you're an incredible champion of this on the Hill. And we need more folks like you mm -hmm. uh, singing, these, uh, s singing these important songs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to dig a little deep with each one of you individually because I feel like you guys all have such a passion and a thirst for tackling this issue in a multi-layered way, right? Be it on the Hill, be it nationally, uh, via the government, be it through the LA Mission in Los Angeles. So Pastor Troy, I want to start with you because you've worked in the space for 30 years, right? But how have you seen um, the landscape of homelessness change within Los Angeles and for people who are experiencing it? Well, my lens is more than just working with it. I, I started, I started my homeless career actually be, being homeless and living on the street after serving my country. I was on the street for seven years, and when I got to the Marine Corps, and through a series of traumatic events, I had some real problems um, that I, there was no solutions for me. And that's the sad testimony that I have to say about it today is that. You know, I came home and really didn't find solutions from the government that I thought I could find um, and found it instead in drinking and, and um, using uh, marijuana and subsequently cocaine that led to crack cocaine. And for seven years, my life spiraled out of control. Um, but it was there I learned some real lessons about the importance of relationships. And so this idea that homelessness can be changed through relationship is what I'm really about. I think the people that um, I met, there's relationships that really were, people were able to see me for the first time. Because the thing about being homeless is that you feel a sense of invisibility, that people walk by you without um, having a sense of care um, of who you are as a human being. Something happens in our psyche when um, we pass people on the street where we um, disengage our ability to see them as a part of humanity. And that has to change. Um, and so I set out um, through a, a series of events in my life to um, change my life. Um, and good people helped me do that. And, and, and so I think that's a part of what we need to do, right? Um, when we talk about uh, what we want to see um, in terms of how to transform people in my 30 years of now doing this work, um, it's very important that we understand that we're not going to solve it if we don't see people first as human beings, that we have to stop ignoring them. And because it's not going to go away just as by saying it doesn't exist. Um, the second thing we have to do is lead with compassion. When we see the Lord, who I believe was the greatest harm reductionist that ever lived, when we see the Lord Jesus reaching out to people, he was always moved with compassion first. And I think that we need to have compassion um, restored in our hearts as a nation. Um, and we're so, you know, diametrically opposed to one another. Um, you know, we have all these differences of views and political views and emotional views and solutions. Um, but we really got to get down to the bare basics in terms of being able to see them as a part of the human race, respond to them in kind, ask them what they need, bring them into their own solutions. Um, you know, a good friend of mine named Glenn Martin always says that people that are often mostly impacted are also have their own solutions in their communities, but they're furthest from power and resource. And, and, and I think that that means that we have to be conduits to the resources. Those that have privilege, 
um, we need to understand that we have an obligation to make sure that we're connecting the power and the resources to um, the solutions that often happens in people's own communities. And if we can do that, then I think that we're well on our way to solve this thing because homelessness can be solved. People weren't born into homelessness in this country like that. Homelessness can be solved. People that you see walking on the street had ideals. There's somebody's son, daughter, um, who they wanted to grow up and become somebody else. Um, and a series of events brought them there. Um, some by their own design and some because the system itself created the apparatus through the war on drugs, um, through decisions we made. Um, um, to, to release people into their own care who could not care for themselves. The legal system has let us down in this regard. And so a lot of these things have contributed to where we are today. And I think in order for us to begin to um, roll back some of these things, it's gonna take um, you know, one person at a time, somebody being brave enough to say, I see you and I wanna do something about it. Yeah. Congresswoman, um, you've led a total of 55 hearings on housing-related issues, as well as Congress's first ever committee hearing on homelessness. You guys can applaud that. It's okay if you can applaud. I'm curious, what did you learn um, from the public during those hearings and also from policymakers? Well, um, let me just start by saying something that we've got to confront, and that is it costs money. It's a big cost uh, that must be realized to make sure that we are doing any number of things. First of all, uh, it was said there was 7.4, I think that you said, million. If you add renting units, it's 14 million. That's right. Between what is needed uh, for housing, uh, single family, and of course, uh, rental units. And so, we all have a role to play. I do believe that we need to have more government resources. I am so proud of LA Mission and the work that they do on contributions and the way that they're feeding people and taking care of people and so many are counting on them, not once a year or twice a year, but every day. And that's very important. We even have churches that have homeless ministries inside the church that are helping. But I think the government has a big role to play. Now, I had a bill that was $150 billion to end homelessness forever. That bill included how we deal with Section 8. We have people who are homeless, who have had Section 8 vouchers for several years, and they have not been able to utilize them. I believe that um, in addition to that, we have to have funds by which to uh, take care of those people who are living in public housing that's falling apart. You know. There are people who can talk about how we were ill-conceived to build the public housing in the way that we have done, and I agree with a lot of that. But when it's falling apart, like in New York, or during the cold of winter, the heat is not on sometimes, the elevators seem always broken, and there is crime mm. uh, in all of these units. Uh, the people sometimes have to move out of public housing and try to double up uh, with someone, friends and families, to have a safe place to live. So we have to put money while we have these units there and while there's so much needed, we have to do some renovation uh -huh. and we have to repair them. And so in that $150 billion, not only do I have uh, covered the cost of building affordable housing we have the Housing Trust Fund mm -hmm. that Barney Frank and I put money into. We've got to help. When these developers who are willing to develop uh, affordable housing, they can't do it all alone. They need to have the help 
of the private sector and the public sector in order to do that. We've got to make sure there's not discrimination in the system, hmm. uh, that people are afforded uh, units based on the needs, not the color of your skin, not whether you're male or female, any of that. And we have worked very hard to reduce discrimination in housing. Uh, in addition to that, let me just talk a little bit about this $150 billion. Uh -huh. Now, we talk about, you know, there are divisions between politics and Democrats, Republicans, and we know that people are homeless all over America uh, in rural communities, urban communities, so it shouldn't be a divided political issue. It should be a bipartisan issue to get rid of it. In rural communities, some people are living in shacks. Uh -huh. Not only do they not have housing, they don't have health care, they don't have ambulance service, they don't have a lot. And so sometimes those people who represent them had to get rid of some of the issues that they're dealing with and deal with the basic issues of having a decent place to live, you know, basic nutrition food to eat, a place where you can get decent health care, federal health clinics, et cetera, et cetera. So we have got to come to the proposition that we need to be neighbors, we need to be friends, we need to care about other people. It's not simply about how good you can do, it's how good your community can That's do. That's right. Because if the community doesn't do well, eventually you're not going to do well because they want what you got. Uh, uh, and so these are all the kinds of things that we have to think about, but I don't want to bypass the fact that the banks in America. <laughs> Let's talk about banks it. Banks in America. I want to tell you, they're not interested in mortgages for low-income housing. For example, in Ferguson, I figured out, after what happened there, that there were houses that could have been bought for $85,000, $90,000. But guess what? The banks don't want you in their banks talking about getting mortgages for low-income housing. They don't think they make enough money on that. And so, people who work every day who could afford those houses that cost $85,000, $90,000 in many of these communities, they can't get a mortgage. Uh, uh, uh. But when the, um, some of the private equity comes in, and not all do it the same way, but when they decide, oh, look at all these, I'll buy 10, I'll buy 20 but they got to raise the rent, and they raise the rent, and the people who are living there in those houses who could have been pay a mortgage if they could have a down payment, and 20% is too much for a down payment, Ooh. particularly for young people. Many of them are working even two jobs. Um, what happened is, again, the banks would not loan money on this low-income housing development. And so, all those people, who could have paid the mortgage, who are now paying more rent, are not afforded the opportunity uh, to own a home in America, which we all aspire to. People work hard for home ownership. They tell you you're a better citizen if you can buy a home. But I want to tell you, when that rent starts to go up, because hedge funds and private equity bought them and they got to make money, then you can't afford it, you can't make those payments, you're going to get kicked out. Now you're homeless. Now I'm not going to talk anymore about that because I have a real problem with the biggest banks in America. <laughs> well, Jeff, I want to ask you this then. Since we are, we're talking about some multi-pronged, a lot of layers here, where do we start? Like, where does the solution begin? and especially for you and the work that you do. I'd like to comment on a couple of things I heard here the last five minutes <laughs> yeah. first, and then I'll get back to your question. Troy, I, I've never heard anybody talk about Jesus as a harm reductionist. Can I, can I quote you on that going forward? Yes, you can. That's, that's pretty good stuff. And then, um, <laughs> Congresswoman, you talked about the cost of this, and I think we've, for a long time as a nation, tried to hope our way out of homelessness and wish our way out of homelessness and collaborate our way out of homelessness. And those are all important things to do. And we need to resource our way out of homelessness. We know what works. And, and this will pivot, Jasmine, into your question. 
what works is providing people the safety and security of a dignified home they can afford and then providing really good wraparound supports for people. And our communities have gotten better and better at doing that in the 30 years I've been in this work. And I don't know if you've seen the same thing, mm -hmm. Troy, like we're better at getting people housed and helping people exit homelessness. What we've not done, not done very well, is to go upstream and prevent homelessness from prevent happening in the first place. So if we're gonna solve this, we need to fund the housing and wraparound supports to help people address their health care needs, their job support needs, their child care and behavioral health needs to, to address mental health and substance use and trauma. We've got to fund all that stuff. We've got to fund the housing subsidies and the housing development. But we've also got to turn our view upstream to start turning off the faucets of why people are coming into homelessness in the first place. And I'd like to talk just for a second about some of the racial inequality we see. And I think you all have hinted at this. Black people are homeless at a rate three times higher than their general population numbers. About 13% of the United States are African American folks. And in homelessness, it's three times that. 37% of the homeless population is black in this country, much higher in some communities. Now, we've made progress on black homelessness in the last couple of years, believe it or not. If you look at the numbers, it was. If I were up here two years ago, I would have said it was 39% yeah. African-American. And that's no accident. That was because Congress funded the child tax credit expansion. Oh, I love that. The, that's great. The, yes, the, uh, that's emergency right. Emergency re uh, rental assistance program that's right. we all funded. Mm -hmm. These things helped black households during the pandemic. So we've got a, a template for how to do this. If you look at the homelessness rates among indigenous people, it's five to one compared to their general population numbers. So while the numbers may be small, the disproportionality is huge, and that's no accident. So when we think about going upstream, what we think about is how do we turn off the faucet from jail and prison onto the streets and into homelessness? How do we turn off the faucet from foster care, where nine out of the 10 of the young people who become homeless out of foster care are people of color, and about 50% identify as LGBTQ. So if we could just turn off those two faucets, even a little bit, not only are we solving homelessness, we're also taking a real bite out of those racial inequities that we're seeing in who becomes homeless. Yeah, and I think, I just wanna add to what Jeff yeah. was saying, because and this is where we're now seeing all this backlash happen in our community. We were listening to a panel earlier that really begins to expose um, this idea that when we start putting resources into a race or to set right some of the inequities that we've had, the racial inequities that we've had in this country, what happens is that people start claiming, um, you know, discrimination, <laughs> reverse discrimination. Yeah. Right? You can't do that. You can't set aside resources for just black people, just BIPOC people. You can't do that. And all that's doing is trying to make the, the, the playing field fair again so that we can all begin to walk as one in a harmonious way. And so this country is sick, you guys. And it's sick because we're not realizing that we're not going under the surface to really begin to deal with the things that, and talk about and expose the things that we need to talk about to heal. We cannot heal if we cannot speak truthfully about what we're facing here. That's right. right? because truth exposes but love covers and when we begin to speak truth we're uncovering something but love can come in and cover up an ailment and this is the reality that we all got to face we owe it to ourselves i was driving around austin and this is a beautiful um, city by the way i love austin but my eyes are always trained now to look for somebody who is unhoused in communities and you know what we did a really good job in Austin cleaning up the homeless population for South by Southwest. And, and that was a lot of resources that did that, I'm sure. Because, you know, and what would break my heart is that when we're all gone from here and we've all gotten out full and everybody now can return back to their stations and the tenant cabins can come back up, then we need to be ashamed of ourselves that if we can just fix something for an event so that we can feel good about ourselves and drive down the streets and our Uber cars and get on our scooters and do all the things that we wanna do to go to the shows that we wanna go to and we can fix it temporarily, we're just putting a Band-Aid on it. We're not going underneath and healing anything. 
But what we're demonstrating to ourselves is that we can marshal resources to do something for a people, but really didn't do it for ourselves. That's why it was temporary. We didn't do it for them, we did it for ourselves, and that's why it was temporary. I'm proposing that we stop this. We stop cleaning up our cities for the Olympics and all these games and all these events, and we just stop trying to move and reshuffle people back to the backwoods and, um, and just clean up the sidewalks so that we can enjoy what we want to do and really not find permanent solutions for them. I'm tired. I'm tired of us seeing ourselves and all of these resources that we're able to marshal and we're not using it for the things that we can use it for. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have an equity in our country. Mm -hmm. And we got to do better, y'all. Mm -hmm. We have to do better than what we're doing. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, he hit upon something. Uh, if you know Los Angeles, you know the various cities uh, that make up LA County. And one of the cities in my district is Englewood. Mm -hmm. And there is a proposed connector project. The connector project is 1.7 miles for $2 billion. Uh, uh. $2 billion that the fan and the state are lined up to support. I had a talk with transportation just a few days ago and I said to them, this is outrageous. This is ridiculous. You cannot have the homeless on the street in LA County, in Inglewood, anywhere, and spend $2 billion on a 1.7 mile connector project that take people from somewhere nearby over to where the new T's are mm -hmm. in LA. Those people have the money to drive their cars. But if you think I'm going to support $2 billion for a 1.7 mile connector while people are sleeping on the street, you got another thought coming. Mm. I'm not going to no, that's right. Well, that leads me to this question. Um, what responsibility do you think policymakers have to remedying this problem? And how do you see a light at the end of the tunnel on the hill with people pushing back? and making those kinds of, you know, line, drawing those lines in the sand as, as you have? Well, uh, when I, I keep mentioning uh, my $150 billion project. Talk about them. Yeah. That was, <laughs> that was my dream. And, you know, while we fight about, uh, you know, parties and all of that, it just so happened uh, that we were in control in the House of Representatives. We were able to pass it to the Senate. It was killed by two Democrats. Cinema, I call names. Yep, go ahead. Out of Arizona and Manchin out of Virginia killed my $150 billion project. And so we can do better. We can not only support what is legitimate and what is needed. You heard the talk here about the number of units that are needed. Okay, you know what is needed and you can cost that out. And whether you're talking about um, dealing with the housing program that we, uh, Bonnie and I put together some years ago, um, or whether you're talking about how you deal with the banks. Here we have inflation. Inflation has caused people with bad loans that they should not have had in the first place, predatory lending, the interest rates to keep going up. You cannot stay in that house when the interest rates keep going up because you had that bad loan that you should not have had. Politicians let them have that bad, that, that kind of, uh, of, uh, of um, no. way of funding and giving mortgages. When we were back in 2008, I believe, when we had the meltdown, it was because of predatory lending. It was because of bad loans, particularly to people of color. You talk about the percentage, I want to tell you, blacks are 47% in the greater Los Angeles area mm, mm, mm. in terms of homelessness. And so politicians who have a big role to play. The, the big banks, I'm fighting a merger right now. They're so big, some of them are too big to fail. And so, what happens is they have a lot of influence. They call, you know, members directly. Uh, they tell their story. 
uh, members buy because they want them as friends, et cetera, et cetera. Politicians can do a lot better, yeah. a lot better. That's the hashtag, politicians can do a lot better. <laughs> Jeff, um, and before we get to the, to the slide up, to the questions, there's a lot of great questions that are coming in. I just wanna um, have you answer this question. With the work that you do with the USICH, do you think this problem can be solved? And I know it's not an overnight fix, I know it's not a Band-Aid fix, right? But do you see it being solved eventually? Uh, absolutely. Down to my core, I believe this is a solvable issue. I, we were, uh, my wife Jessica and I were sitting in a talk earlier today that Dr. Kendi and, uh, uh, and Amber Payne were giving about the power of storytelling, and they've launched uh, an emancipator online newspaper. And, and Dr. Kendi was talking about in the 1820s when the original abolitionist newspapers were launched, the people who were speaking out, speaking truth, speaking towards justice, had no conception that it was actually, uh, that, that slavery would end in their lifetime in the 1820s, right? They just didn't know. They were, they were fighting an uphill battle. And homelessness feels like that right now. It feels like we're, we're fighting an uphill battle against the housing market, against people uh, on the Hill who don't want to fund the kinds of things that you're putting on the table. Um, but if you look at any change movement, whether it's marriage equality or the American Civil Rights Movement or the anti-apartheid movement, there are some really dark days where I'm sure the people in those movements feel like, are we ever gonna win? Are we ever gonna achieve our aims of equality or of overthrowing tyranny or, or oppressive systems? And, and change does come, but it comes through not just, not just hope and not just solidarity, but, but really continuing the fight, strategizing as well as you can, waiting for the political moment when you can fund the, the yes. things you wanna fund, when you can pass the legislation you wanna pass. Uh, but we are in a tough time right now. I think we're in, a, we're in a very dark moment as a nation broadly, but also in our work to end homelessness. There are a lot of forces arrayed against evidence-based practices, things that we know work, they're under attack. Things that, uh, that we know help people exit homelessness are not getting the kind of uh, bipartisan support that we would want them to get. So I think in those moments, what I find is that you just have to dig down and and find a different way to keep working, building new partnerships, and, and each of us doing our part. I mean, certainly elected, elected officials have a huge role to play in this, and so do folks on the ground in community doing the work, but so does the business community, so does the faith community, so does the sure. entertainment in industry, the, the sports teams. Okay. We need everybody coming together, bringing what they can in terms of creativity and resources and power to drive these things. And the last thing I would add to that is we need people who have experienced homelessness in positions of power to shape these policies. And you know, Troy, I, you embody that. And, yeah. and what we've seen in the last few years mm -hmm. is on the national scene, more and more people coming into positions of power, including elected positions in the House of Representatives, <laughs> people who have experienced homelessness That's and right. bring their, their passion, bring their, their intelligence, but also bring the, the pain and trauma of that experience into positions of decision making. And uh, there's just incredible power in that. If I may tell you, when you ask about do you believe that we can conquer this problem, those people with power and influence and resources gotta believe. Yeah. They've got to believe that this problem can be solved. You know why I believe it? I come from a family of 13 children in a little place called Kinlock, right near Ferguson. Mm. And I want you to know that we lived in inadequate housing. And then my mother, who was a very, was a very hardworking woman, found a way to get people and put it together, a little three bedroom, not three bedroom, three room, three room little house. We didn't have running water. We had outdoor toilets. And we lived in this little three-room house. We went to church every Sunday, went to Sunday school. We prayed, we did everything, we worked hard. I believe that back in those days, we didn't see people on the street because the church took them in. Now, come on. And their families took them in. You live with your grandmama and your grandfather and everybody else, your cousins, your aunts, what have you. So we've come from that to where we are now. 
I believe it can be stopped. Yeah. I believe coming from that kind of understanding of how people were locked into literally nothing almost and coming to the place where we can get a mortgage means that we can do better now. More people can own a home or can pay the rent. The salaries got to keep up with the cost of living. We've got inflation. We can't let people use gouging now as an opportunity to call it inflation. We got to get the gougers out of inflation. And we've elected officials got to help work on that with the feds. And we've got to all believe, if you believe nothing else, believe that people have a right to a decent quality of life. They have a right to a home, they have a right to health care, and they have right to nutritious food. I go to, every, go to bed every night. Sometimes I feel like I've been beaten uh, to a pulp. One good night's sleep, I wake up in the morning, I'm ready to go to fight. Yes. I'm going to fight for the people because that's why they send us to represent them. Yes. That's so good. You know, when people, when people ask me, do I believe that homelessness can change, I just tell them, take a good look at what change looks like. Yeah. Because every strata of homelessness, from you know, being drug addicted, homeless, a veteran, dealing with drug-induced psychosis, and being able to come back from a cardboard box, mm -hmm to where God has placed me. And for such a time as this, I believe that God wants to use my life to show the world that hope is, is not just possible. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Take a good look because this is who you're passing by on the street. This is who you are looking at and not seeing them. You're looking at the Troy Bonds of the world and the hope and the possibility of what their life can become and how they can change other people. So when you ask me, can homelessness be changed? Yes, it can. Is there hope? Yes, it can. I'm the living example of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Thomas Vasquez um, is asking, can you talk more about the connection between addiction and homelessness? And I know we touched on that a little, but I allow everyone to just. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's a misnomer to sit out here and think that everybody that's homeless is addicted to drugs. Now, let me tell you this, living on the street a week, a, a, a year, seven years, that can make you want to use something because the trauma of homelessness itself can cause somebody to want to escape. But really, homelessness is just exposing what we already have going on in our society as a yeah. big, listen, we cannot ignore the fact that there's mental, mental illness in our society. We cannot ignore the fact that there is addiction in our society. But what homeless is doing is showing us the, what's happening is that people that are homeless on our street don't have access to resources to deal with. If they can't mask it, they can't just live every day and be able to get high and still be in their houses and their apartments because they don't have access to the resources. And this is what we're seeing. And so, and that's why it's so pervasive. That's why we say, oh, and that's why people always think that's the only thing that makes up the homeless population. But it's not true. It's just simply not true. And so when we talk about the connection between addiction and homelessness, it's a real connection because it, human beings are not meant to live that way. And when we don't want to, when we can't face something that we're not to do, we escape. All of us find ways to escape in this room. And that's the way people do it. They just escape through drugs. Is drugs a part of it? Yes, but it's not the only part of it. I want to go to um, Clemens Bulmer. He has a question that reads, can we, can we combine US, the US's innovation, innovation prowess with Europe's social, strong social safety nets to achieve the best of both worlds? Jeff, I'm curious if you have an answer yeah, to that. Yeah, it's like Clemens is following me around this week with that <laughs> question. I, I was uh, talking earlier this week with some folks from Helsinki, Finland, who took a, an idea that was developed in the United States scaled it up and have made dramatic reductions in homelessness in the nation of Finland. 
uh, the, they took an idea, an innovation from our country called Housing First, which is basically the idea that housing is the stable foundation from which people can get a job, keep a job, reconnect with family, deal with drug and alcohol addiction, deal with mental illness, deal with physical health issues. Housing's the thing, but you also need to provide good wraparound Wrap support. Around, sir, what Finland did was take that idea and bring it to scale to address what was a really significant street homeless population in their country, and they've knocked it down to nearly zero. I mean, they've really made incredible progress. Now, some people still slip through the cracks and they've got a really good system for outreach and engagement and trying to, to catch people and get them back into housing, but they've taken a really comprehensive approach to this with the nugget of, a, of an American idea brought to scale. Now, our problem here is that we come up with all these great ideas, then we don't fund them, to meet the need. And then we say, well, that, that didn't work. Yeah. Well, it's not that the thing didn't work, it's that we never put the resources in it to address the, the scope of the need. And that's, that's what we've done. We've tried to scope the problem to the resources we have rather than scope the resources to the size of the problem. Yeah. If you come from someplace like Switzerland, uh, where they believe in you know, assisting everybody, uh, the resources are put into every aspect of living. We have not come to the point where people really believe that in this country, that everybody deserves a right to a decent quality of life. And when we can instill that in people, it sure would help. Yeah. Yeah, for goodness sake, we fought against universal health care. Like we don't, you know, we, we, don't, we, we, we don't want people to have a better right to health care. You know, our country fought That's against right. it. We're still fighting against That's it. Right. And so we don't believe that people have a right to care we're certainly not gonna believe that they have a right to housing. That's right. And so, and we can get all the banners and we can get all the quotes and we can say all the positive things when we get on, you know, into our political arenas. But the reality is, is that what you do so loud, I can't hear nothing you saying, mm. you know? And so we gotta start standing up and making sure we're holding people accountable, lifting up our champions that we have. You know, we have a champion right now in this seat that has been fighting for years to really make change. And then, you know, and people want to blast her for the work that she's doing and everything that she's doing, but she's fighting for the people. But isn't that the reason why we elect our yeah. officials? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. To fight for the people, to represent the people. And when we get people to do that, and then we want to excuse people that want to fight for themselves. We want to make excuses for people that want to really tear down this country and everything that we're fighting for. Listen, I fought for this country, and, and, I, and I'm proud to say I did so. But the reality is, is that people are, that are elected into this office are no longer holding up to their creeds that they, and we gotta start holding them accountable. Yeah. So this question of, of housing as a human right is a really important one, because yes. there are some countries that believe that more That's than ours right. does. And I, this is the one that I sometimes start losing a little hope on, because we've got this sort of, pull yourselves up by your bootstrap attitude about, you know, people should just be able to make it on their own. Well, none of us ever make it on our own with yeah. anything, so let's dispel of that myth. But if you look back to the beginning of this country, public education was not a guaranteed right. It was only wealthy people who could send their kids to school. And we made some decisions along the way that made public education available to everyone. Now, it, it has been uh, racially discriminatory, it's been segregated, it's been separate and unequal, it's had a lot of problems. I'm a, listen, I'm a child of Alabama public schools, so I will tell you there are problems with our education system, but the reality is that used to not be a right, and now it's a right, and we fund it. We fund it mostly with local taxes, but also with federal funding. We made that commitment to one another, and so far we've even that made that commitment to children who are in this country regardless of their documentation status. Okay. We've said okay. kids should go to school, so we're gonna do that. We could easily get there with housing. And you, know, you talked earlier, Congresswoman, about the cost of funding these things. There is a tremendous cost of not funding That's these right. things. Absolutely. And that cost is, you know, it's numerical on our That's systems, right. but it's also the cost in human life right. of people dying every day on the streets of That's this country. Right. And if we can start coming together on that, that it's, okay. it is not okay for any one of our brothers and sisters right. to lose their life without a home, That's right. that everyone needs to be in the safety and dignity of a home, then we're getting somewhere. Right. And we're Absolutely. getting somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, the last question that I will throw out before we conclude to each one of you is, 
what can this, this generation of young people, private citizens, and what can they do and how can they be empowered to do work and, and effectively make change, right? I love our young people because they're not impacted politically by any kind of party. They know when they hear truth, now they're going to call you on your crap. They're not going to deal with people that don't show up with their authentic selves. That's what I love about our young people. Um, but our young people don't trust the system. That's right. And so, and we need them to impact the system. And so I'm doing everything I can to encourage our young people to exercise their right to vote, marshal their collective voices, be the change that they seek, bring their gifts and their talents and their innovation to the table because we need them more than ever. The Bible talks about the elder and the younger yoking up. And the reason why that's important is because at every critical point of any society or any relationship, there comes a point of transference that needs to happen. But when our young people are waking up with a level of consciousness that we don't understand, because we didn't have access to the level of information. And so when they're able to get information and then they go into school and they say, oh, we're not gonna talk about critical race theory and then, but they can go online and understand, well, wait a minute, we have some problems in our country. So they're gonna say, well, wait a minute, we need to, <laughs> I mean, they're gonna do some questioning, right? And you talked about education is important, but what's equally important to education is that we're teaching the truth about who we are. And I think our young people are hungry for it. And so if I can do a shout out to our young people, keep fighting, we need you. I, I know I do, because I'm, I'm getting, a, I'm, I'm being young, I'm a little bit older now. And I need young people that I can transfer stuff to, deposit into, and that's why that work is important for me. But young people are our future and they got to they gotta hold what's up, and we're not leaving them much to hold up, right? We're destroying, dismantling this great country, this world, and we're not leaving them much, the legacy. And I say, and so I also want to apologize to the young people um, for the poor work that you've seen your elders doing in terms of trying to leave you something that's worthy of it. So jump in the fight. It's worth fighting for. We have something good here. Get into the game. We need your voices and don't allow anybody to lie to you. Yeah. Congressman Warner. Well, I think he said it all. Uh, our young people don't trust us. They don't trust the systems. We have people working in the gig economy. Uh, you know, they're doing two jobs. And Four and five of them are crowded in apartments because they can't afford uh, a unit of their own, despite the fact that they are working as hard as they can. Whether they're working in Uber or Lyft, two jobs, uh, like I said, they're trying to make it in the gig economy. You have um, banks who won't do startups with brilliant young people, brilliant young people. Uh, you have venture capitalists who give to those who are already successful, but they are not investing in the talent and the ability of young people, particularly in this new technology uh, that they should be putting more uh, time and attention in. We've got to tell them what we are doing to change things and why it's important to register to vote. What is it gonna mean? What do you know about your elected officials? Have you researched their records? Get a group together and pick some elected officials. Look at their records. What did they vote for? What did they vote? All you know is you get a ballot with a bunch of names on it. You don't know who they are. And so we got to help people to understand, use your brilliance and your smart to do the same kind of research on elected officials that you would do if you were buying a new car. You know what I mean? You know everything about that car. You know everything about what you're spending money on. We don't do enough uh, to engage them yes. and to include them. You know, we have, um, we have, we have uh, adults who go to political meetings or go to places where people are being successful and can share information, but they don't bring the children with them. They go themselves uh, because they're participating in some way 
but it's bring the young people with you to those kinds of meetings. Take them where people are talking about doing things and being successful at things and what it takes. And so I think they don't trust us, I agree with you. I don't think we do enough uh, to make them believe in us. That's right. And so I have to tell you, when you show the love, it comes back. It comes back. Why do you think I'm Auntie Maxine? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, on that note, do you have um, something to add? How can we empower this next generation to feel like they can be a part of the conversation and effectively make change when it comes to the homeless, homeless issue in America? You know, I, I joined the Biden administration about two years ago, and I love my job, even, even though it's, this is, these are hard times, it's complicated <laughs> in Washington, D.C. But the best part of my job is that I get to travel around the country and meet with people who are homeless, meet with the outreach workers. I'm a former outreach worker myself, so I get to meet with folks who are doing the real work. But I get to sit with young people. They're, they're often in groups called youth action boards that are really driving local solutions to youth homelessness. And it is so incredibly inspirational to me when I see these young people who have experienced unspeakable trauma in foster care, in, at the hands of their own caregivers, and They've come through homelessness and now they're helping fix the system that, that failed them. And what I would say to young people, whether they've been homeless or not, is there's work to be done. Come join us. It is, uh, it is hard, but it is incredibly fulfilling. And we're in this battle to solve one of the most deeply entrenched problems in our society. And we need you. We need you to educate yourself. We need you to think about work in this space that's really helping with homelessness and healthcare and all of the related issues. Um, but get involved. Teach yourself, teach your, your peers, and, and come join us in this work. All right. Well, on that note, thank you everyone for coming out and um, <laughs> listening to this discussion with us. 2050 Project, Reimagining Future Cities Without Homelessness. I'm Jasmine Simpkins, Troy Vaughn, Representative Maxine Waters, and Jeff Olivet. We all thank you for being with us this afternoon. Here at thank you. Yeah.